I mean, it's not like a real one, but I mean, it's still, it'll give you five feet. I'm sorry I didn't make more. Yeah. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Um, I just got back from Israel, and we spent two of the most fascinating weeks, really, of my life. It was, it was absolutely awesome. Came away with four things I want to mention. I don't remember what was and thank God we have a geriatric doctor here as our guest speaker because it's a demonstration of my geriatric brain <laughs> to, remember, to, to not be able to remember four things. Um, the trip I was on was sponsored by a group called the Republican Jewish Coalition. I know that doesn't <laughs> balance. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> but I was surprised. At the influence that this organization has, that's 30,000 members um, around the country. And they gave us access to such senior level people within the Israeli government. And I just could not believe it. Right? We spoke with the mayor of Jerusalem. Right? This was, remember, we were a group of 14 people. And we got the mayor of Jerusalem to give us 45 minutes. We got uh, Dory Gold, who, who was the ambassador to the United Nations, to give us an hour and a half. It just went on and on. I mean, it was just fascinating. Uh, Moshe Yalon is the deputy prime minister, hour and a quarter. And two senior advisors to Prime Minister Netanyahu, who spoke to us one for an hour and a half and the other one for an hour, five minutes. We had the head of the Iran desk at the, um, we saw the, uh, help me out, Foreign Ministry. So, four things that came away. Number one, the number one issue throughout the Israeli government right now is Iran. They believe so much more than the U.S. government believes that Iran is on the cusp of, of getting a nuclear weapon. Everybody in the world is concerned <coughs> about Iran getting a nuclear weapon. That is not the issue. The issue is when. And Israel has proof that this could happen within a few short months. They are that close. Where the Obama administration thinks they're a year away. So there is a gap in understanding, taking the same facts and, and reaching different conclusions. Uh, and that is what almost everybody talked to us about the seriousness of what would happen if Iran got the nuclear weapon. And just their saber rattling last week when they, uh, when they started talking about closing the Straits of Hormuz is just a, a small demonstration of what would happen should they join the nuclear community. Because they are a regime without a conscience. And it, it, it's dire should that happen. And not just Israel. And Israel <clears throat> is positioning the issue, not as an Israeli issue, but as a world issue. And ask of us to go back to our communities and try to influence our government to just take it more seriously. <clears throat> so that was one takeaway. Another takeaway was the Obama administration's recommendation that negotiations between the Palestinians and Israelis begin at the 67 borders. What was shocking about this was that every president Republican and Democrat, back to Lyndon Johnson, 
clearly stated that the 67 borders are indefensible. And they're not borders either. You're right. You're right there. Right. It's, it's a line. But they call it a border. Ceasefire. Right. There's a ceasefire line which Israel cannot go back to. And every president <coughs> has said that. Not only that, the United Nations said that. Even W? In, in UN Resolution 242. Yet, Obama, Obama alone, said, let's get the peace talks started, started again, and started with 67 borders. Okay? Um, the result of that was a lecture by Senator Yahoo to Obama as they sat fireside, which turned out to be a big embarrassment for, for Obama. Um, and relations between the two administrations are, uh, became tenuous for a while. We actually got better when uh, Palestinians wanted to go for statehood in, uh, in the UN, and there was a lot more collaboration between the two governments uh, when, that, when that issue arose. Okay. Issue number three is the State of Israel against the New York Times. Or, to put it more clearly, the New York Times against the State of Israel. Um, and I have here, uh, the New York Times asked Netanyahu to write an op-ed piece. And Netanyahu refused. But he refused by having his senior advisor to the United States, his name is Ron Dermer, a um, guy from, from Florida. In fact, a lot of the people that we met are all former Americans in the Israeli government. And such smart people, it's unbelievable. I felt cowed at that. Humble even? The, uh, the U of Shaka. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so this guy, Ron Dermott from Florida, writes for Netanyahu, the, the, to the New York Times, the opinions of some of your regular column, columnists regarding Israel are well known. They consistently <laughs> distort the opinions of our government and ignore the steps it has taken to advance peace. They cavalierly defame our country by suggesting that marginal phenomena condemned by Prime Minister Netanyahu and virtually every Israeli official somehow reflects government policy or Israeli society as a whole. Worse, one columnist even stooped to suggest that the strong expressions of support for Prime Minister Netanyahu during his speech this year to Congress was bought and paid for by the Israel lobby, rather than a reflection of the broad support for Israel among the American people. So anyway, in the name of Netanyahu, this letter was, was sent to the New York Times, who of course refused to print it. And so it got printed by the Jerusalem Post. And it, it is fascinating. And just another issue that in the in the world, Israel looks bad, and they know that. But they believe they are trying for peace and, and can't get it. Which leads me to another takeaway, which is that there is a group called Palestinian Watch, palwatch.org. And their executive director spoke to us and showed us example after example after example. Oh, the Palestinian, Palestinian Media Watch, Watch yes. Um, of recent programs in the Palestinian society where they are still teaching kids to hate Israel. There is still not a map within the Palestinian controlled areas that has Israel on that map. The kids are taught that there are only three cities in Israel. Haifa, Jerusalem, 
and Ashdod. Excuse me, Haifa, Jerusalem, and um, Jaffa, excuse me. Everything else are Palestinian stolen areas. That's the way they refer to the country. They still have all their track meets, all their soccer matches are all done as a memorial honoring a uh, a terrorist who who um, who has given his life a suicide bomber and the, and the the latest one which was in November just less than two months away two months ago where they honored the uh, the terrorist that, that killed 31 people okay and then the soccer match the trophy is named for that uh, for that terrorist and Mahmoud Abbas gave the award and as part of his award speech he's honoring the, the terrorist there it's not that Israel doesn't want peace the Palestinians don't want peace they don't want peace their view is they don't get peace tomorrow they're fine all right if it takes 200 years 300 years they're fine they don't want peace it's not uh, the Israelis. Okay, last takeaway. We were taken to an army outpost. I mean, a, this was a real live outpost right on the Lebanese border uh, near a kibbutz called Avavim, but they were, we were right there. And we had lunch with them. You know? they, they sleep in uh, what looks like truck trailers, all right? They, they're, they, they're huts, you know, the, the uh, steel little buildings, right, that are uh, freezing cold. Man, were they cold. And so I asked them, what could we do in the States? What do you need? And the big answer was fleece, all right? One guy, had on, it has to be in, um, in green, but um, I'm wearing a fleece top, just to, to show you, you're wearing a fleece top. They are, the fleece is unbelievably warm in the cold. And one guy actually bought, he said it cost him 150 shekels, and you know, you know, 40, 50 bucks to, to get a top, it's like a sweatshirt. And he takes his stripes, and he, and he takes it off of his uniform, and with a safety pin, he has his stripes over here, all right? But they were so cold. I mean, they, you know, we were, we were sitting in, in a non-heated lunchroom, and, uh, and they were, <coughs> gave us very lovely food, all right? And, uh, and uh, toilet paper for napkins, all right? And, and they were shivering. These guys. Haven't they heard of fire? Right. So, so <laughs> when we went to Moshe Yalon, when we went to Moshe Yalon, who is the uh, deputy prime minister and former chief of staff of the army, one of the people in our group asked him, "What's going on?" And he said, "Nah, this is not a question of money, because we certainly have enough money to give them uniforms. All right, one airplane costs more than everything else." Um, can I finish my sentence, or do you want to interrupt right now? I might interrupt right now. Okay. You don't mind. The South Jersey Men's Club, in case anybody isn't aware of this, we not only have donated money for fleece, and we, we did this uh, about three, four years ago, we also went out and we bought fleece gloves and had them shipped there. That's so we do understand what you're saying. They've got a police. They've got a police. Senior official, the deputy prime minister, said it's, it's, a, um, it's a question of management, not a question of, um, uh, of money. He says, but you know, these guys want fleece. They're freezing. So anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to buy a box of fleece tops and send it specifically to this outpost. No, now, by the time it gets there, a piece of summer. No, you don't want to do that. If we can supply the money, I, I can do like I did that last time, right. make arrangements because whatever you uh, sure. buy, there's a 17% back tax. And instead, we arrange that it's purchased there 
and we, we can buy more with the same amount of money. Uh, this is right. Why, why are we buying with this? They've got more than enough money. Why don't they go down to their local Army Navy store and buy as much fleece as they want? Why are they without it? They are without it. told us that. All right. They are without it because it is not part of the, the Army uniform system to have fleece. So the guy's got five bucks in his pocket. You can go buy whatever you it's want. It's five bucks maybe at Costco. Yeah, right. <laughs> you go into a store in Israel and it's 55 bucks. Well, you okay, it's a lot of money. money. Okay. okay, anyway, I'm going to make a contribution. Anybody else here wants to make I'm a making, contribution? Making a I, look. I was with a group, the group that took us there was called the Friends of the IDF. Anybody ever hear this group? Yeah. <laughs> All right. And I was really impressed. Anyway, those were my takeaways. And yes, Michael. Yes, I see. I would suggest that we uh, do a collection, come up with some money, and that perhaps we can have some from our funds also participate in it. I'll make the arrangements so that they the exact units that you want get to plus others. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, anyway, I was really impressed at the heart of these guys. I have a picture uh, uh, of me with an M16 holding it, you know, because they demonstrated the, the different guns they have, and I was able to look at it, and then they had this super telescope for focusing right in on the uh, Lebanese um, town that they were overlooking. Uh, it, it was absolutely fascinating. Okay. Um, okay, on to other stuff. Um, Ed, you wanted to talk? Just as a reminder, I represent our organization at the JCRC. And just a couple of things. I made an announcement last month that there was the JCRC is now focusing on Israel advocacy. And there's been a film series that started at the various temples in the area. I made an announcement last uh, meeting about the first movie. Uh, I was kind of disappointed we had five of our members show up. I would hope to see a better participation at the next. However, you didn't, in case you uh, are concerned of what you missed in that film, several years ago we had a speaker who uh, talked about the media uh, problems with Israel, which Jerry just mentioned with the New York Times. And I think if David still has that CD, we, anybody who's interested in getting the media watch, um, you, that was basically the theme of the first movie. Uh, at your table is a listing of the other movies. I would hope that we have more participation from the South Jersey Men's Club at uh, these events. In addition, Alan had mentioned last time about um, the University of Pennsylvania is going to have a program uh, supporting the boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel. Uh, there's something on your table about that. Uh, just for your information and your concern, and you might want to make a statement about that. Uh, yeah, uh, several years ago, there was a similar program held at the same place on the campus, and I was there for it. And as I was coming in, there were a group of Jewish students handing out flyers, and they were protesting the event, and they were trying to get, make people aware of the fact that a man named Norman Finkelstein who is a proud enemy of the state of Israel, and he makes a living bashing his name, was going to be coming the following week. And one of those students went up to the microphone during the question and answer session. And instead of asking a question of the uh, panel, he started talking about conspiracy theories. And they said, well, what is your point? Ask your question. And what he did was he ripped open the shirt on the inside, he was wearing a t-shirt with a photo of a kind of in a shirt. And so he was escorted out of the building. <laughs> and then later on, Alan Dershowitz held up and the flyers that these kids were handing out. And my question to the speaker uh, that night, the crossing the line movie, was, what, how do we address this? How do we go face these people who are Jewish, who are doing this? And they said, that a recent survey said that 22% of American Jews are uh, supporters of the state of Israel, 8% are uh, opposed, and 70% are apathetic and don't care. And 
we said we need to reach out to those 70%. Thank and you. make them aware of what the situation is and make them supporters of the state of Israel. The original uh, um, a topic of a future meeting will be the, uh, uh, the crisis on campus. We've got the, the DVD to, to show, and we will, we will have that as a topic of a future meeting. In fact, the original program that we attended, had that was the theme, the crisis on campus. And part of the purpose of these films, and you might want to even bring family members, is to give the children going into college some sense of how to respond to the anti-Israeli movement. Because right now they don't have a clue on how to respond. Lastly, uh, almost lastly, um, also on your table there's a, an announcement about Alan Dershowitz is going to be uh, speaking at the University of Pennsylvania's free program, Thursday, February 2nd, uh, an evening of unity and community solidarity. Uh, this is sponsored by a variety of Jewish organizations, including the Federation of South Jersey. So I encourage you to consider going to that as well. And lastly, even though I've been on the board of the uh, JCRC, I didn't know that there's such an organization called the Catholic Jewish Commission. But they just sent us a, they just sent us an announcement that the Jewish the Catholic Jewish Commission is going to be running a program for the homeless. I know it shocks to some of you that I actually opened an email, but uh, this is how I got the information. Um, so Tuesday, January 24th, they need volunteers to feed the homeless. Uh, churches and synagogues are going to be taking care of the homeless in this program. So on Tuesday the 24th at St. Mary's Church, a Catholic Church off of Springdale Road, uh, the program starts at 5.45 at night, and they're going to need people to help feed them, make, uh, make a dinner. If you're interested, uh, see me later, but the phone number, you talk to Pat, a woman named Pat, at 609-220-7309. I'll try to get this out through Randy, and you can see me afterwards as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. I uh, just wanted to remind everybody, we have any guests today, by any chance? No guests. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Announce yourself. Yes. Sorry. No, come up. Uh, stand up and tell us who you are and what you do. Dave Blue. <coughs> Dave Blue. Where are you from? Centennial Mill. Very nice. Are you retired or are you working? Of course, retired. <laughs> Glad to have you hope to join us uh, as a full member. I uh, just want to remind everyone we can always. Uh, use a turnout, especially with uh, the topics that Jerry brings up about Israel. I think we're all pretty much committed to what's, uh, what's going on, and the hope is we can bring in more Jewish guys to experience what we're all going through, and I think that's why we come here every Sunday and sometimes more often, or once a month, excuse me, and sometimes more often than that. But uh, if you know anyone in your neighborhood, uh, in your community, in any other organization, brought to Larry, your past president, Larry, uh, if you could bring in uh, one or two uh, potential members, that'd be great. Anybody needs an application, let me know. Thank great. You. Okay, thank you. Okay, Bob, you want to introduce any other? Anybody else want to talk to uh, to us? Talk about anything? The uh, the snow on the ground and the plow, plowing. Anything you want? To World talk? Wide Ramp. Does anybody know where there's going to be some uh, services for people who want to go to that? The Conservative Synagogue will have. Federation of Jewish Men's Club has a worldwide rap. Yeah, right. and the conservative schools, sure. like I know Bethel has, uh, I think it's next month, I think it is. And there's some and there's some some they all have on their services on a Sunday, usually, um, worldwide rap. Yeah, worldwide rap, um, you know, teaching about that. Can you explain what that is? We just did. What is it about? What is yeah, the worldwide rap is to instruct people and instruct people and to reteach when when you when you go to the shul in the morning you wrap to film. Oh right. And, and the other one. one. Huh? The other one. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a lefty. I put it on this one. <laughs> 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 
And it was a pain in neck because she had to re take it apart and do the knots to get it on his hand. So I put it on his hand, that's why I do it. <laughs> but all, all the other conservative schools already have it set up. And I think it's, uh, I'm sure it's next month. We have a very interesting speaker today. Uh, uh, one list. Uh, um, but before we get to that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Just one more request. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm about you, we have a great crew that sets up early in the morning, and sometimes we have a few people that don't show up, so we're a little short-handed. So we're going to pass around a sheet. If you're willing to come by eight o'clock to help us set up, just put your name and phone number down. And if I need somebody, I'll just call you like the day or two before. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And a sheet is going around if you want to contribute to, um, to fleece. 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 You want to fleece the idea there's a, a pad going around. Uh, and put your name on it if you want to make a contribution. Okay, we're going to let Mike collect the money. Then we will have an audit of Mike. <laughs> That would be interesting. Just, just one more quick thing. In view of the fact of what Richard just said about uh, the breakfast, we take it for granted. But the following people are here every month early to participate in making the breakfast. That includes Rich, who brings the the logs and the hard boiled eggs. I'm giving you some recognition and credit because I don't. I know you don't get it anywhere else, Rich. <laughs> he still isn't here. Um, Ned is here every month. Um, Marty makes the coffee and is here early every month. I also am here every month. <laughs> so I think these. Oh, and I'm sorry. And Dick Knopf, you know, if you enjoy the vegetables, he's the guy that brings it every month. I have to encourage him all the time to uh, bring ripe tomatoes instead of glass tomatoes. <laughs> hey, Blake <late> Produce Junction. <laughs> You want recognition too for the orange juice? Okay, Bob Greenberg for the orange juice. Yeah, and if I can remember to get to Edmonds, we'll have dessert too. <laughs> uh, two things. Bob, two things. I want you to do two things, Bob. I'll do at least two. For you, three. Four. Uh, first of all, I want to remind you we have MEI coming up on the 22nd of March. What's that? Mid-East Institute. Okay. And we have the law breakfast. Actually, MEI is 25th, I think. And we have the law breakfast, the law enforcement appreciation breakfast, which is on the 27th. If you haven't signed up to volunteer for either one of them, please do. We will need your help. Now, the 27th is a Tuesday. The law enforcement breakfast We'll begin at 8.30 in the morning. We'll be probably done by 10.30 at the latest. Okay? It's starting at 8.30, but we'll have But we need people there by like 6.30, 7 o'clock. Okay? 6.30, 7 o'clock latest to help out. I can introduce the speaker. I can tell it over and ask him a question about insurance, whatever you want me to do. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Any time. Uh, I have been asked to do the introduction, so please bear with me for a minute here. Our speaker is uh, Terry Ginsburg. She is a doctor. She currently uh, is the director of geriatric fellowship at the UMDMJ and is a medical director at ACE at the Kennedy Hospital. Uh, in her role as a, a director of fellowship, uh, she's a medical, she oversees the medical students, residents, and fellows. Uh, she did her residency at, PCO, at PCOM and uh, she uh, did her geriatric fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. I hope you would. Give a nice warm welcome to our guest speaker. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank South Jersey's Men Club for having me, especially Jerry, for having me come here this morning. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, and I know it was snowing last night, so I appreciate everyone coming this morning for breakfast. Uh, just a little bit uh, more information about myself. If any of you heard of any ACE units in South Jersey, Few hospitals do have them. It's called acute care for the elderly. 
unit and in the hospital at Kennedy Stratford, we have a floor that's just designated to patients over 65. Um, and we cater towards functional assessment, memory assessment. We try to prevent delirium in our unit. And it's all the nurses are trained, trained in geriatrics. Um, we have a geriatric nurse practitioner on the service. And there's residents and medical students as well that uh, rotate on our unit. Uh, but it's a unit that we hopefully will improve over time and um, have more patients come to our unit. It's just for geriatric patients. So um, we help our patients get out of bed. We don't check vital signs in the middle of the night. Uh, we try to get rid of medications. You know, a lot of us might be on 13 medications. We're always trying to get rid of, you know, proton pump inhibitors, Nexium, PPIs, whatnot. So um, it's all just geared to the elderly population. So we don't have a projector, so I'm kind of have to read to my, my PowerPoint. I apologize, I, I didn't know. You have to have it set up months at a time at this facility, but we'll, we'll work with what we have. So my lecture today is to be living to be 100. And the goal at the end of this lecture is for you guys to you know, grab on some concepts about preventive screening, taking care of your overall health and well-being, um, being proactive and empowering yourself with your medical conditions. For example, understanding why your doctor's giving you a certain medication, what certain lab tests you have to get for certain disease states. Because again, as the doctor, we work together as a group. Um, we're not just the person who comes to heal you. You're supposed to heal yourself as well. So it's a combination, it's a group effort as the doctor and the patient relationship. So does anyone know who the, one of the oldest persons living, and she died at age 122? There's a picture of her, but I can't show it to you. Does anyone know? Jean-Louise Comment. Has anyone heard of her? So she was the longest living person. She died at age 122. Her father lived to age 94, and her mother lived to age 86, and she never worked. She bicycled, she exercised, she swam every day. And you know, the question was asked to her, how did she accredit her long longevity? Why did, how did she live so long? And she said she would have an occasional glass of port wine and a diet rich in olive oil. So that was what her, uh, her reasons were. At 85, she fenced. She rode a bicycle until age 100. And she quit smoking at age 119, which is very interesting. That's why she died. That's why she died, exactly. Um, and she released a rap CD, believe it or not, at age 121 called Time's Mistress. So what is the advantage of living to be 100? Does anyone have any idea? Exactly. <laughs> well, first of all, I think there's less peer pressure at that age, right? So. So when we think of aging, you know, we have a lot of ageist viewpoints out there. We, you know, our younger counterparts think aging is as something that's an asexual lifestyle. Aging patients don't work. Um, aging patients are depressed. There's a lot of myths that we have to kind of eradicate. So we know it's not a disease as we age. It's something beautiful, and hopefully we're living a quality of life as we, as we age. It occurs at different rates among different individuals and within different individuals. And as we get older, we have increased susceptibility to certain conditions, macular degeneration, cataract, prostate cancer, colon cancer, um, some memory deficits, sometimes late onset depression as we age. So that's common with aging. Um, it does not generally cause symptoms as we get older. So that's a myth. So what do you think the average life expectancy is right now? That's General, just an average right now. 76. About 78. Mm -hmm. And what's the maximal life expectancy? 122. 120. One or more. So just to give you a little idea about life expectancy so you understand, we only lived to about 28 years in the Roman Empire. In the 1900s, we only lived about 49 years. In the year 2000, the age life expectancy was about 78. And by 2020, we're hopefully going to live to 83. So that's how it's just increasing and improving. The time of Christ to 1900, the life expectancy increased three days per year. And 1900 to the present, life expectancy increased 110 days per year. So we are living longer. The fact is, why are we living longer? We're taking care of ourselves. We're empowering ourselves. We're exercising. We're eating healthier. We're participating in life. 
So in 1900s, it was rare to have centenarians. You really never met a centenarian. In the year 2000, there's about 61,000 centenarians. And by 2050, there'll be over 600,000 centenarians. Just to give you some statistics. So JFK has a beautiful quote that he wrote. We have added years to life. Now we must add life to those years. And I think we have to constantly think about that. How are we improving our every day? Are we reading? Are we learning a new language? Are we doing puzzles to improve our brain function? Because you know we exercise to improve our legs, our heart, and health. But how do we exercise our brain? Um, and I always teach my residents that Alzheimer's disease is brain death. So how do we improve our brain? And I always try to read something that I don't know about. I try to read about cars or art or something that I just don't spend my livelihood on a daily basis. So we really need good care. We need really good geriatricians out there. And unfortunately, there's a dearth of geriatric doctors. People don't think it's the sexy fellowship. I actually think it is. I think it's wonderful. But we need a lot more recruitment. We need to get our, L our residents, our young residents out there and show them that it's a beautiful field to go into. So the combination of a longer life and less illness is adding life to years. Do you agree? Yes. As well as years to life. So how do we successfully age? Because that's why you really came here this morning. It wasn't the locks, the bagels. So we have to have cognitive functioning. How do we have better cognitive functioning? How do we improve our physical uh, being? And how do we engage ourselves in life a little bit better? So there are certain keys to successful aging. The first thing I talk about when I meet patients in the office is cancer screening. And there's different groups, American Cancer Society, Geriatric Society, the, um, the internists have various societies. On oh, when do you stop screening? So if I'm an 80-year-old gentleman um, coming to my office and I meet, you meet you for the first time and they're saying, well, I don't want colon cancer screening anymore. I don't want to get my prostate screening. Well, we really still advocate for colon cancer. But this is when I advocate for colon cancer screening and prostate cancer screening, since I am speaking to mostly men in this group. If you have high cognitive functioning, you're still participating in life, and you're working, or volunteering, or exercising every day, and we know that your life expectancy is going to be another 10 more years at least, then I highly recommend continuing getting colon cancer screening. If you are a frail patient coming into my office who has end-stage heart failure, who has uncontrolled hypertension, who's on dialysis, then I probably would stop doing colon cancer screening. So I advocate for my fairly functional patients in my office every 10 years to get colon cancer screening, with the exception if you had colon polyps and you have to follow them more aggressively, whether three to five years per whatever your GI doctor recommends. Example with prostate cancer screening. Over 80, we always have the watch and wait, and that is consistent. So if you're over 80, we really don't keep on recommending to do PSA testing and do digital rectal exam. Because if you found out that you have prostate cancer over 80, we're really not going to treat it. However, when you're getting between the 60 to 80 age, then that's a little iffy. Because we can do a TERP, we can do the robotic surgery, the robotic prostatectomy, um, and we still do screening yearly for PSA digital rectal exam, and we follow your PSA accordingly. Cervical and breast, we continue to check breast cancer screening in all my female patients and cervical cancer screening as well. And there's no group out there that says when you're supposed to stop. So we consistently do it because breast cancer increases with aging. So vision and hearing. Um, most of my patients in my practice have hearing aids. They don't work and they're too expensive. Um, but we consistently say get, go to the audiologist. We screen everyone in the practice to go to the audiologist. And hearing, we see macular degeneration and cataract surgery. So that's a higher propensity with aging is having the um, cataract. So. What happens if you get depressed during the talk? Depressed, oh, well, we, we have so many depressants here. Uh, we give it. So let's talk about dementia, because this is a hot topic, and it's just getting hotter and hotter, because there's all this information about you know, food to help prevent dementia, medical food is out, that's the recent studies that FDA is working on right now. So we all develop memory loss as we get older. It's inevitable, okay? The question is, do we just have benign memory loss, or do we have memory loss that starts developing into a dementia-like illness? 
Now there's something called mild cognitive impairment, also known as MCI. And that has, a, that has the risk factor of developing dementia. However, MCI is something that I talk to my patients about and I say, continue reading, do word puzzles, you know, do jigsaw puzzles, learn a new language, continue to exercise your brain. When you start having dementia, early signs of dementia start with memory loss. But dementia goes further with that. You start having difficulty in recognizing family members. You have difficulty recognizing how to use a fork, a knife. Um, you have problems with smell. So these are different aspects of dementia. We know Alzheimer's dementia is the most common type of dementia. There's also Lewy body dementia. There's vascular dementia. There's Parkinson's dementia. There's AIDS dementia. I can go on and on and on. Um, but most, most of the patients that I see in my practice have Alzheimer's dementia. Um, I'm sure if you've had family members and you've seen it, it is a progressive disease. It's insidious and it's slowly progressive. Um, but you know, if you have a risk factor, whether it's a, fa a father or a mother who had it, um, you really should just try to, try to be a proponent and constantly exercise your brain. Talk to people. You guys are out for breakfast, meeting new people, um, and, and doing, you know, reading a lot of books and whatever you can do. But it is treatable in the fact that we can treat the symptoms of dementia. <coughs> for example, depression is common with dementia and psychotic behavior. So we do target the psychosis associated with dementia. That's what I say it's treatable. It's not reversible right now because there's really nothing that can eradicate the progression of the memory loss. There's no great pill that we can take. The pills that are available right now are just to help you function in life better and to be able to use a fork and not to be depressed and not to wander outside your house. And that's what we do at our Center for Aging. We do a lot of treatment on behavioral modification of dementia. Regarding immunizations, everyone should get a flu shot every year. Um, you know, we always give everyone a flu shot. We give a pneumococcal vaccine after age 65. And then I think you can have repeated pneumococcal vaccines if you have end stage COPD or if you're severely immunocompromised. And then you get repeated pneumococcal. Otherwise, you should have one after 65 and then done. Tetanus booster, we do every 10 years. We recommend you have one. Obviously, if you slip and fall, you get hurt, we immediately give you a tetanus booster in the emergency room as soon as you come in. So, hypertension, yes? Shingles, which I just... Shingles, thank you for bringing that up, and I have to add that. We do recommend over 65, CDC is recommending a shingles vaccine for everyone now. So we're starting to give it in our practice as well. Now it's okay after age 50. Oh, changed, okay. We've only, since I have my practice at 65, that's where we're starting, but yeah. It's very important to get the shingles vaccine, absolutely. You know, anything can incite it. Stress can incite it. Prior history of uh, chicken pox, um, low wife. altitude, huh? A nagging wife. A nagging wife, any stress, 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 and stress. Is that number one or the first thing? So there's a lot of treatment for that. You can no, okay, I'm not gonna. So hypertension. So we know hypertension is the silent killer. The recommended blood pressure reading for anyone, it doesn't matter if you're 60, 80, 90, 20, 40. I want my patient's blood pressure to be 120 over 80. That's it. Now, there's a lot of myths behind that, okay? We used to be say, okay, if someone's over 65, keep them in the 160 range, 150, because that's where they live, and if we bring it down too quickly, they're gonna get dizzy. Well, that's completely wrong, okay? The true fact is, you have to maintain a normal blood pressure. A normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. 130 and above, you're starting to get into prehypertension. 140 is stage one hypertension. So we advocate to make sure you eat a low salt diet, forget about what we eat for breakfast, and we advocate to maintain that you exercise, exercise, walk, keep the blood pressure down, um, and if you're not controlled on one of your blood pressure meds, you might need another one to add on. So it's the silent killer. It can cause stroke, heart attack. So we really have to be a proponent in getting the blood pressure down. Smoking sensation. Got a question. Mm-hmm. Question. Sure. You read the printout, you get past 65 or so on these medications, these blood pressure medications, and some of the medications men take for prostate and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Man, I'll tell you, you know you're getting older. I mean, you talk about, you know, this 
Medi and then they come out here with these things you can take for sexual functions. I think well, mm -hmm. you don't know what the heck to do, or what or what or what the heck to go to go on. So you say to yourself, okay, your doctor says take these medications, and you take it. Right. And that, and that you, I mean, this is should this be the attitude? No, absolutely not. That's why I'm, we're going to get to medication area, polypharmacy. You should know every single one of your medications and why you're taking them and the side effects. So when you go to your doctor's office, you have to bring every med and say, I need to know what's the reason for this one. And you can also, I mean, on the internet, you can look up, it has some information, but you should not just accept the doctor giving you a medication and go on your merry way. I always teach my patients what medications they're getting and why they're taking it. And I'm always trying to get rid of meds because med medications cause toxicities and especially two medications together can cause more toxicities. So again, you should always empower yourself. You're the consumer. You're coming to the doctor to help you. So you shouldn't just walk out of the offices and not know what you're taking. And medication is one of the biggest problems. It causes toxicities. It causes acute kidney injury. It can cause dehydration. Um, a plethora of side effects from medication. So smoking cessation. I hope none of you smoke in this room. And if you do, you're, hopefully you'll quit today. Can we um, smoke outside? <laughs> Actually, I think, aren't they going to ban it in this area outside? You know, UMDMJ, by 2012, you cannot smoke even in the whole parking lot anywhere. They're going to completely ban it, which is wonderful. Actually, New Jersey has a law that says you can't smoke from these 25 feet in public building. That is really good. Um, we know it's the single most preventable cause. It causes peripheral vascular disease. It causes vasoconstriction of your vessels. Um, I mean, colon cancer, lung cancer, multiple problems. Um, so I, I can't talk more about smoking, but you really have to just stop. Exercise, exercise, exercise. You should have at least, you know, all the journals and everything say three days a week of 30 minutes cardiovascular. And that's not just walking around the mall. And that's not doing wood chopping. My patients tell me, oh, I clean the house and, I, and I'm cleaning outside and I'm, I'm you know, cleaning the leaves, that's not exercise, okay? We know that. You have to do aerobic exercise for at least a half an hour. I have a cardiologist who says walk. Walking so, is great. He, I mean, he says the other stuff you can do without it. Walking is, walking is the best. If you can do a half an hour, three to four days a week, beautiful, you know, warm, you know, get your gloves on, your hat on, you should be walking every day. It's very important. It improves the mind. It helps with memory impairment also. It improves glucose intolerance. It keeps your glucose levels down. It lowers cholesterol, as we know, exercise. It reduces prevalence of depression. And it improves your quality of life. Now, how about osteoporosis screening? How many of you have had DEXA scans at all? Let's see, one, two, three, four. That's not really enough in this group. Over 65, you should at least have your DEXA scan done. And then if you don't have osteoporosis, usually every two years, your Medicare will pay for that. Uh, if you have osteopenia, you have a high risk of developing osteoporosis. So what do we do for osteoporosis? We recommend calcium with vitamin D because we're not in the sun enough. We're not getting enough vitamin D. In fact, what we're finding is most of my patients in the outpatient setting have low vitamin D levels. So that's a problem. So I'm giving, I, most of my patients are on vitamin D right now. I continue to follow the vitamin D. But calcium is so important. As we age, there are certain bone diseases that can develop, osteoporosis. If you have any kind of kidney impairment, you can get adynamic bone disease. You can get osteocysticus, uh, uh, one of the disease states that you can get, osteitis, cysticus. Doesn't calcium uh, <coughs> kidney stones or something like that? Calcium can, no, actually, if you have kidney stones, they actually tell you to take calcium. The most common uh, kidney stone that you can have is calcium oxalate stones. Right, and actually, you want to take calcium for calcium oxalate stones. It actually prevents it from getting worse. That, that is the treatment. Mm -hmm. And thiazide diuretics. Mm -hmm. uh, with calcium and vitamin uh, D, magnesium and vitamin K, does that make it work better? Everything I've read says it does. Well, there are stones that, are that you can get from magnesium stones as no, well. Saying, does that, uh, that enhance the uh, calcium and vitamin D working on your body? With taking magnesium? Yeah. You know, I don't... That's what I heard. You yeah, haven't heard about that. But I'm going to say, I mean, just talking about kidney stones, but yeah, just to mention, because he met it, there's various kidney stones out there. Actually, there's calcium, there's strivite kidney stones, there's um, hypoaxillate kidney stones. They actually say to take calcium. It's actually prevented, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. 
I can show you that I can prove to you that it's I true. I believe you. Yeah, but I, absolutely, uh, 100%. I kept thinking it was the exact opposite, mm -hmm. that taking calcium would instigate No, the because the cal it is. It's actually true to take the calcium. Um, one in four women fracture their hip. So we see in the hospital hip fractures rampant, and then they end up be, get developing a, a DVT in their leg. Then they can end up developing a lung pulmonary embolus because they're bedridden, they're immobile. So to prevent hip fractures, exercise, take your calcium, check your DEXA scans, at least over you know, every two years you should be monitoring that. It is a treatable and preventable disease, osteoporosis. So you have to be a proponent. How do you maintain your nutrition? Are you maintaining an adequate weight? Are you eating high fiber diets? We should be having 35 grams of fiber a day. Are you having low fat diets? I mean, that's what we really try to be a proponent of. Are you taking adequate calcium? Are you taking your vitamin supplements? Are you ta taking a multivitamin every day? Are you having proper dental and oral health care? My patients never go to the dentist in my practice. Um, and they say the reason is it's too expensive to go to the dentist because they don't have dental insurance. Problem is, is that they have malfitting dentures, they have abscesses, they have a couple teeth left in my practice and they're not doing anything. They can get endocarditis, they can get a lot of problems from developing teeth infections. So make sure you floss every night, use your Listerine twice a day, be a proponent for adequate dental health care. Now let's talk about diabetes a little bit, about diabetes. 25% of patients over 65 have diabetes. It's pretty big. How are we developing diabetes? Well, obviously, obesity leads to diabetes uncontrolled with your carbohydrates, what you're eating. Um, you know, there's type 1, there's type 2. Sometimes it's genetic. And then late onset diabetes. I'm finding a lot of my elderly patients over 60 to 65 are starting to develop diabetes. So we check the hemoglobin A1C. That's pretty much the test we're using now to diagnose diabetes. So if it's over 6.5, your hemoglobin A1C, you pretty much have diabetes. If it's 6.4 and lower, you have the glucose intolerance. You have a high predisposition of developing diabetes. We screen for complications. We send to the eye doctor, the foot doctor every three months, the eye doctor at least every six months to a year. Um, and my elderly patients in my practice, I would say, most of my hemoglobin A1Cs are between 6.5 and 7. And that's really good because when you're taking diabetic meds, sometimes you have a higher risk of becoming hypoglycemic. You can die of hypoglycemia much quicker than you can die from hyperglycemia. So again, really make sure you're getting your hemoglobin A1Cs monitored, making sure that you're going to the foot doctor, the eye doctor, and you want it between 6.5 and 7. There are certain medications that we really don't advise to take as diabetic meds in the elderly. I don't like the, um, the sulfonylureas, like lipizide, uh, like glyburide, because they tend to cause hypoglycemia. But again, like that gentleman over there, he's not here right now, was talking about monitoring medications. If you're feeling weak a lot during the day and you're fatigued, maybe you're becoming a little hypoglycemic and it might be the medications that your doctor's giving you for the diabetes. And we have a whole armamentarium of diabetic meds out there that are safe as we get older. And, and that should be tweaked and looked at. You think an endocrinologist is a good idea to go to? Absolutely an endocrinologist. Yeah, we do, we do a lot of diabetic screening in my office. But absolutely, I would recommend an endocrinologist if your hemoglobin A1Cs are hard, hard to control. Your sugars at home are in the 200s, 250s, and you can control them. Absolutely, because again, diabetes you can get you has a high risk. Diabetes is the number one cause of kidney chronic kidney disease. So we don't want you to be on dialysis. We don't want you to develop any kind of end stage uh, renal problem down the line. So you really have to be a proponent on what you're doing for your diabetes. Well, now let's just you know about metformin. Metformin, you know, that's the number one drug we use. The only thing we have to be really careful with metformin is if your creatinine, that's a measure of your kidney function, is getting over 1516. That's when we stop the metformin because it can cause lactic acidosis. I haven't seen a lot of that, but it can cause some belly issues and problems. And that's a medical emergency, believe it or not. So metformin is a wonderful drug. It brings down the hemoglobin A1C. It gets your sugars in really tight control, but you have to be careful. It has a lot, it does have some side effects, and you have to be careful. That's all. But we use it all the time. I read articles uh, regarding metformin as a possible prevention against cancer. Have you heard of anything like that? I haven't heard anything about metformin. Yeah. 
Yeah. Is that a recent uh, article? Life extension magazine. Real, real. What, what magazine? Life extension. Okay. Haven't haven't heard that. I don't know. I, I was taken off of uh, my numbers two. Two got better, and I was taken off of Actos even before they came out with that. Mm -hmm. The only thing I take right before a meal is Prandin, and my, my, my blood sugar is pretty much under control. And Prandin's beautiful to take because you take it right before your meal, can control, control your your meal sugar time. Exactly. So that's wonderful. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of segueing into what you asked me about medication. Polypharmacy is rampant in the elderly. There's, there's certain medications called PMIs, potentially inappropriate medications. What are some of the inappropriate medications as we get older? And this is some of the medications, and some of you might be on it. Um, Ativan, Valium, Xanax, they're benzodiazepines. Okay, that's one of the classes. The benzodiazepines is a class of drug that can be dangerous as we get older. Why? They cause you to fall, you can get confused, uh, you start becoming a bit resistant to it, so you have to keep on going on a higher dose. So we really don't advocate using benzos. Also PPIs, I'm sure a lot of you guys are on it for heartburn. Nexium, um, what other ones can I think of? Prilosec, okay. There's a lot of toxicities down the line associated with these medications, okay? Um, they have some risk factors. There's been issues with osteoporosis with these medications, some CNS, some memory impairment with the PPIs. So we don't keep any of our patients on them long term. If you were treated for them for like gastric ulcer or gastritis and your doctor wanted you on it for six weeks, we assess see if the symptoms are getting better, and I pretty much stop them. There's no reason to keep you on them. I have patients who've been on them for three or four years and they don't know why they're on it. Because they were in the hospital, they saw their primary, their primary never stopped it, they came back to the hospital, the doctors in the hospital never stopped it, and they've been on it for four or five years. Get rid of it. So the question is, if you're on these meds, talk to your doctor about it. There are side effects down the line with these medications. Mm -hmm. How about the weaker ones like Zantac? Zantac is horrible because it causes memory impairment. We never use that. And I'm going to say PPIs have a very high risk of causing acute interstitial nephritis. It's the most common medication. It's called AIN, acute interstitial nephritis. It's the most common drug that causes that. And that's a problem with your kidneys, okay? That's, it. that's a big problem. So. I've been on Cryosec 40 milligrams, sometimes twice a day, now once a day. Mm -hmm. Just went to my gastro doctor. He wants me to do an upper GI and an endoscopy and a mm -hmm. colonoscopy and just had it last year. And I said, what am I going to get off of this? you got to keep taking it. So what well, do I okay, do? Well, okay, right. So you need to discuss and you have to show him the facts or show him something well, that long term. He said, I need it. So. Yeah. <laughs> then, you, then you know what? The solution is you need to go to a geriatrician in conjunction. Because as geriatricians, we get rid of meds. We don't leave meds on. If you are symptom free and you're having no symptoms related to it, there's no reason. It's not, it's not gonna prevent you from getting another ulcer. Okay, it's treating the acute problem right. and then get rid of it. Or just slowly go off of it rather than just... Uh, you know what, I don't wanna tell you guys okay. not to because obviously I'm well, not I your don't doctor. Think, but I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, I would say that. I would advocate. What were you gonna say? I, I would just say, ask all, um, for anyone I didn't meet, I yeah, resident. Yeah, she works with um, me, she's my resident. I would say, ask the GI doctor, why? Okay, I need it, why? You yeah. have that um, conversation, and if, if you need it, you need it. Right, but, um, I mean, we're, we, we... They're telling you why. The thing is, when I get off of it, I, I develop acid reflux. That's right. So, the reason I take so, so, the, so the question is, yeah. are we masking why you're getting it, and why are you getting acid reflux? And I'm just going to throw this out to everyone. Obesity can lead to acid reflux. What you're eating can lead to acid reflux. Are you eating after seven o'clock at night? Are you drinking a lot of coffee? Are you eating a lot of chocolate? Are you eating a lot of peppermint candies? Are you eating a lot of fried foods with tomatoes sauce in it? I mean, the thing is- Hey doc, you're killing me. You're digging it great. I know, I know, he doesn't like it. But, but I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, because we're a generation like likes putting a Band-Aid on our problems, the Band-Aid covers it, and we can still have bad and naughty behavior. Get, let's get rid of that naughty behavior. And I'm not saying you do any of that. I'm just... You don't know how naughty he is. What is it, in the morning? It's older than Uh-huh. That we can't make it through the night without having to go to the bathroom. Right, so nocturia. 
So you're having Noctorium. 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 Right. So it's 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 your urinating Noctorium. at night. Noctorium. And Ashley, do you want to add? You want to explain to why they go to the bathroom at night? It's common once at night for a lot of patients to go at nighttime. Anything you want to add to that? Go for it. Okay. So it's common to go to the bathroom. First of all, it could be medications you're on. You could be on a diuretic. And it's common that could cause you. Also, as we get older, our prostate gets bigger. Prostate gets bigger, it causes you to urinate in the middle of the night. So it's common. That's not abnormal to go once during the night. If you're going three to four times at night, the question is, do you need to be on a medication to shrink your prostate a little bit? Are you, know, are you taking too much diuretic? Uh, are you in heart failure? And what happens is all day, at nighttime, you're lying flat, so everything is causing the fluid to be shifted, and you're urinating at night. Or do you have a urinary infection? Uh, you know, there's so many different etiologies of why someone could be urinating at night. So once during the night is fine. Once during the night is fine. Yeah. You're safe, Jerry. You're safe. When, when, when we think of urinary frequency, it's more than eight times in a 24-hour period. That's what we get worried, and that's when we're concerned about urinary frequency and incontinence. And then we have to do urodynamic testing. We have to do some looking at your ureters, looking at your bladder, you know, assessing all of that. Checking your bladder scans. Did you have a question in the back? Yes. Uh, you hear a lot about cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Do you know you hear a lot about triglycerides? I mean, we are proponent. We get our triglycer triglycerides less than 150 in my practice. If it's over, if it's over 150, it can cause pancreatitis. It can cause a lot of problems. So I use Lavaza in most of my patients in my practice. It's a prescription. Uh, basically, it's like eating salmon and it doesn't have the mercury in it, and it beautifully controls my patient's triglycerides. So you want to get your triglycerides down. It's dangerous to have it high. Is tricor for that is tricor, triglyceride, uh, fish oil. Uh, there's there's no. fish oils over the counter. The omega-3, you, some of you might be on omega-3, but I recommend Lavaza, it's excellent. That's a pricey drug. It is a pricey drug, I know. That's Some of the, the downside. Yeah, that's the, it's a tier three drug. So a lot of, that, that is a problem. But you know, unfortunately, it's what your plan is. Yeah. Yeah, you know, certain medications we're okay with Eugene Generic, and certain medications we want to use the brand necessary drug. Certain, like digoxin, I only, want to, I only use the brand necessary. There's certain meds that generics won't work as well as the brand. So you have to just be careful with, and, and that's why I always do a medical reconciliation of all the meds when my patients come in. I say, okay, can we take a med off today? And we look at the list. And I always make my patients bring their meds with me. Because you might have seen, you know, Ashley last week, and she gave you a new medication, and I don't have it on my list. And you forgot to tell me. I always want a brown bag approach. Always bring your meds to me. Mm -hmm. What's your view about C-reactive protein levels and homocysteine levels? C-reactive protein, so it's a non-specific lab test. Um, if it's elevated, what we sometimes, and you don't have an infection, and you don't have cancer, or you don't have any other etiology for it to be elevated at that moment, it sometimes is a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease down the line. And what we do is we try to risk stratify. Get your blood sugars down. Keep your BMI down. This is your area, right? Uh, maintain your uh, diabetic meds. I mean, everything like that. So it is, a, it is a risk factor in my mind, in your mind, to say, okay, I need to do a lifestyle modification. Homocysteine levels, too. We check that as well for heart checking for heart, you know, heart healthiness. So again, we monitor them. It's not a regular test that the insurances will pay for. Um, I try to go around the system and write reasons why I'm ordering it because it's, they don't usually will say, okay, well, why are you getting a CRP? Because it's so nonspecific, but yeah. Two questions. Mm -hmm. So many people at our age complain of lower extremity swelling or edema. Mm -hmm. At what point do you get concern? And the other question is, what age do you recommend screening for peripheral vascular disease? Right. So we recommend over 65 for peripheral vascular disease. Um, some patients, and you know, I look at the risk factors. So if they've been a longtime smoker and they're having claudication symptoms, meaning when they walk, they're having pain in their calves. They're having pain when they walk. That's claudication symptoms. I start screening at that moment. Okay. So claudication is really dependent on risk factors and symptoms at that time. Um, if I see someone with lower extremity edema and it's acute onset, and say it's one leg, for example, I always want to make sure you don't have a blood clot. If it's both legs and they're starting to accumulate over time, I ask, what's your symptoms? Are you having shortness of breath? 
Are you having you know, shortness of breath when you go to sleep? Or is it early signs of possible heart failure? Um, if it's not causing any symptoms and they're just lower extremity edema and it's mild, I might tell them to use TED stockings. Um, I feel for their pulses and their feet, making sure that they have good pulses. If they don't have good pulses, I then do some arterial testing. I do venous testing on their lower extremity. I tell them to elevate their legs above their heart, not just elevate it like this, really high elevation, because it's not gonna do anything. I look at the medications I'm giving them, and they are on a calcium channel blocker. Calcium channel blockers like Norvask can cause lower extremity edema. Was it dependent on the medication that I gave them? So you really have to kind of look at the history of when the swelling started, what can be the culprit of it, and again, you want to rule out any kind of, you know, like we said, peripheral vascular disease or something. And most of the time it is peripheral vascular disease. And we have to say TED stockings, eliminate smoking, get your blood pressure controlled, and all of that. So polypharmacy is rampant as we get old. Can we all agree? We're on more meds than we should be on. 25% um, of the meds are unnecessary. 40% of the, we, we use about, you know, elderly patients use about 40% of the medications out there. We have the highest incidence of adverse drug events as we get older. And Medicare Part D coverage, that began in 2006. So that's when we were looking at what meds and different plans have different medications on the plan. So you really have to talk it over with a family member who could help you with that. Cholesterol screening you mentioned in the back. Um, high cholesterol is a risk for coronary disease in the elderly. We start with statin medications. There's been problems with statin medications causing myalgias. Some patients can't be on them at all. Um, and in that, in that situation, we kind of try other medications. Sometimes I refer to Dr. Rader. He's an incredible cholesterol specialist at UFP, and he does a lot of um, uh, research on cholesterol and changes with your whole body. So sometimes I have to refer out to cardiology, but people who are actual lipid specialists. Um, we really want to increase our HDL and lower our LDL. That's what we want to do. Falls. Falls, falls. They frequently lead to death and disability. They're often due to medications. Again, medications is one of the biggest culprits of most of all of our problems. It can be prevented because as we get older, we become sarcopenic. We have muscle wasting. It's common. It develops in all of us with aging. So we always have to do resistance training. If you go to the gym, you have to do weights. Doesn't matter. You know, you don't have to be sitting there with free weights, but you should be doing the equipment to help you because you want to maintain muscle mass because muscle wasting occurs with aging, and then that leads to frailty, and that leads to increased mortality and morbidity, and then we fall. So why are some of us escaping cancer? Why are some of the 90-year-olds and then the centenarians escaping cancer? There's been studies done at Albert Einstein Hospital in Manhattan. Um, and basically, some of us have protective cancer genes that we will bypass the colon cancer, the prostate cancer. And we live to 120, 130, and we're living older. Um, and there's about 42% cancer in the oldest, oldest that are actually surviving these cancers that we're seeing in their 60 and 70 year olds. They're called tumor suppressor genes that they have, and they're doing a lot more research on that. And a lot, a lot more research needs to be done. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States. 1.3 million new cases were diagnosed since 2003. And statistics show that mortality due to cancer increases up to age 70, and then it plateaus and then declines. So if we can make it past 90, we're pretty good, I think. Um, and deaths account for 40% from age 50 to 69, and 4% over age 100. So I think that's why our lovely lady lived that long. Um, cancer in the oldest, oldest, our nine-year-olds, our centenarians, most of it, non-skin cancer is generally delayed, believe it or not. The oldest old delayed the onset of cancer by over a decade. So again, lung cancer has a decreased prevalence between the centenarian and the non um, agenarian subjects. And what again is helping us? And this is new research that's being done. Are there tumor suppressor genes? Do we have some type of protective gene that um, some type of chromosomal abnormality or abnor uh, uh, change that's protecting these patients? So these are the 10 commandments. I'm sitting here at JCC. So I, I think I should talk about the 10 commandments for successful aging. So number one, keep active physically. 
maintain an appropriate exercise program, keep active cognitively, actively participate in intellectual stimulating exercises like you're doing this morning. <laughs> keep active socially, maintain an active engagement with life, travel if you can, you know, just keep yourself active socially. Keep up to date on appropriate immunizations. Get your shingles, your pneumococcal, your flu shots. Keep up to date on the appropriate cancer screening interventions. Adhere to strategies for good nutrition. Keep up to date on screening for osteoporosis, hearing, and vision. Screen for hypertension annually and achieve good blood pressure if hypertension persists. Smokers should pursue a smoking cessation program. We always give that to patients in the hospital. Every single COPD patient is giving smoking cessation education. And number 10, diabetics should adhere to strategies to achieve good blood pressure control. And there's some societal issues associated with longevity. So we're living longer. This is the biggest problem that I seem to think about as we get older. Depletion of financial resources, that's a big stress. Delayed retirement. Competition for jobs with younger people, it's a big problem. Increased insurance premiums and health care costs. The population is increasing, is there room for us as we age? Increased urbanization and global warming. <coughs> Emerging infections as we get older because we're more immunocompromised as we age. Increase in poverty. We're not getting older, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting, oh, I forgot. <laughs> Thank you. So just, I mean, Questions. Uh, first, the one, first one. <laughs> yeah. First one is: uh, you need a script in order to get a shingle shot. You need a script to get a shingle shot. Second, what are the potential side effects of a shingle shot? They're bruising at the site, pain at the site. Otherwise, you get it more than once. Right now, We've only been giving it once so far. I have to find out if. No, you what can. I mean was, can you get shingles more than once? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. definitely. I've had a patient who gets it every year. He seems to get it. Yep, and he gets Valtrex. We have to do the. Yeah, any questions? Uh, my mother had mild dementia, and she can remember things 50 years ago. But if we spoke to her. She couldn't remember what you said five minutes ago. Have they found out any reason for that? I get that. For the, or the, for the early recall. Right. You know what, that's still part of the, you know, the early recall is the biggest problem. And we do find that in the mild cognitive impaired patient. Right. We don't know really, I mean, we know that there's tacks and plangles and yes. problems with different areas of the brain that affects reasons why we have recall problems. So it's the area in the brains that we're seeing. That's why they're having these, you know, the neuronal cell death and... And the other question, do you replace the family physician or supplement the family physician? So I supplement. I, as it, well, this is what it is. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an internist and a geriatrician, so I see primary patients all the time. Right. And I'm also as a consultant to family physicians as well. And I would never replace it if you were seeing your own doctor. I can, I can, you can come to me as for geriatric issues and I can send your primary care doctor what I recommend. Mm -hmm. How do we get in touch with you? Do you have yeah, I'm going to give you the information. Okay. The New Jersey, I'm, I'm at the New Jersey yeah, Institute for Successful Aging on 42 East Laurel Road. Do you guys know where that is? Yeah. It's right, yeah. the Kennedy Stratford Hospital is here, oh. and the big office building is kind of next to it. Um, and I'm on Suite 1800. And actually, I can give information. Jerry, do you have a card that I have where I can give to Jerry and he can kind of disseminate it? Yeah, but I'm in, I'm in Suite 1800, and it's called the New Jersey Institute for Successful Aging. I just wanted to comment on the shingle shot and go fast in mm -hmm. case somebody's yeah. a little apprehensive, perhaps worried. Was that since I don't normally do well with uh, the pneumococcal shots, I was a little apprehensive about it. Sure. But uh, anyhow, the um, I got to say this much: they, they normally have to have it done at the pharmacy typically, and uh, the gal gave it to me, and she just wait 15, 20 minutes and make sure you're not on the floor. Right. And I passed that test. Okay. The uh, fortunately, I. The, should they put it in the fatty tissue, they don't put it in the muscle mm -hmm. tissue. And uh, I 
She said, however, she said, we always recommend that you allow a day, like if you're going to do it on Thursday, plan to take off Friday because you may have some effects. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to say that the only thing I, I felt the next day, I did it on a Friday night, the next day basically is like, you knew you had the shot. Right. I felt a little, I'll just say odd, but mm -hmm. not sick. Yeah. Again, not having done well with flu shots, I was really afraid. But it turns out it really was a breeze. Great. And, yeah. uh, Did you have black hair before you took the shot? <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought there was something different about it. But I couldn't quite notice it. But anyway, <laughs> like, I was only five foot two. felt the black Oh, that's <laughs> good. But anyway, it was, it, was, it, was a little, it was a good experience. Yeah, I've had. And, and I, yeah, I echo what you're saying. My patients have done fine with it. and. Um, is no problem. Is something new? They, they just recently recommended that over 65 you have. He's saying 55. Um, in my practice, just because it's 65. But they are, CDC is recommending getting it yearly now. And not yearly. To get one over 55 and then. 10 years. On the cognitive Yeah. The degrees of that, and does it necessarily lead to Alzheimer's? So it, not, it doesn't necessarily lead to it. You just really just have memory loss. That's it. You don't have the executive problem. You just might have early recall, or you forgot where you placed your keys. Um, and the way to prevent it, and, and you know, there's been some risk factor of developing dementia. It's not 100%. Um, they don't have the exact percentage on how many patients actually start developing dementia. But if you know that you're starting to have memory problems, we recommend just doing brain activities. And they do say the puzzles, exercising your brain really helps. So, but there's no variation. It's pretty much just memory loss. That's really it. There's different, no stages. I have a mother, 100 years old, and a uh, oh, great. of mine, in her 90s, had a stent, a couple of stents put in, the defibrillator or whatever. Defibrillator? Yeah, seems to be well. That's, thank God. And you know what? Genes, genes, genes do help. <laughs> so if you have blessed with good genes, you, I mean, a lot of the times it's just your genes. So, you know, we were talking about like boostering for hepatitis, boostering for, um, I'm trying to think what other boosters that we don't really check that. I think if you're in like, uh, you know, a lot of the residents and medical students have to do, and, and doctors who work around patients, we always usually have to get our hepatitis booster, check our hepatitis levels and our antibodies. And in the outpatient setting, I don't recommend that at all because you're not really in communal around patients. And you're around and you have a new grandchild. You know? There's no recommendation for that. Do you, do you handle, like, my mother was in her 80s. Yes. She has a lot of back pain. Mm hmm So do you, as a dermatologist, are you skilled at handling that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah. We deal with back pain, the pain meds that we use. We also have um, an OMT specialist on in our faculty as well who helps the aging patient work with, you know, lumbar stenosis, compression fractures. We, we deal with all of that back pain and the biggest thing with back pain is the pain meds because if you're not inappropriately treating with pain meds the pain gets worse because a lot of patient doctors are afraid to give pain meds and we under treat and the pain gets worse so that's a big problem that we're trying to work through but yeah we do all of that so. doctor thank you very much thank you so much some information about about your practice so that we can sure. circulate. And I can, look, I can email you. You hear Yes. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for having me. What a here. wonderful presentation. Great. You, you do have one more assignment. Okay. Wait. Um, Take one picture. Okay. Uh, we have a uh, presentation for you, a certificate oh, thank of appreciation. You. Thank you. All right. I know you're going to. Um, um, Wait, Treasure. I am. Oh. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you so much. I'm really impressed. Um, you do have one more assignment, and that is to pick the winner of our 50 50. Okay. $45. $45. $45 and a box of Girl Scout cookies that, that Ed Silver wants to donate oh, yeah. to. <laughs> That's why I gave it away. <laughs> um, 
Of course, you only get half the box because this is a 50 50. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. How many? Just one? Just one. Come on, Terry. All right, I'm going to. Six eight seven 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 five. Six eight seven. No, that's that's not the right number. All right. Oh, put it back and take another one. He won. <laughs> Again. Burrow. Again. Again. Excellent. Excellent. Remember, if you if you are going to contribute to this fleece program, this ad hoc thing that, that we're doing, please see Mike Perloff um, very quickly. He'll tell you if, you if you're writing out a check, who to write it out to. Um, One more quick announcement. Yes, Steve. Steve Horowitz. I, I was remiss in saying that Steve Horowitz is here every month early, so he, he hit me in the head with that, so let me give him the credit. Okay, uh, next question. The name of the doctor we go the, back to the last. Uh, so, uh, 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 Rader, Dr. Rader. The, the one who does uh, the Pator and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Rader, R-A-D-E-R, D-E-R. He's at University of Pennsylvania. Yep, he's at Trump. Oh, I forgot his first name. Oh, he's yeah. not. I'll find but he's great. He's great. He's highly written and, edu and he's excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Enjoyed it. Oh, I'm glad you did. I, I, you know, my wife has a one that's diabetic. She's really having a hard time.